Hi, I'm Alastair, I'm a games designer, and normally in this channel I describe how you can create escape room puzzles using technology like an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. But in this video I'm going to describe a slightly different piece of technology, and that is this d Stike wristwatch which I've just got hold of. Now, uh, this was advertised in my Facebook feed, and the description said that it was a de-author watch. Now, de-authoring, if you're not familiar with that term, is a kind of hacker attack um, where you have a device that connects to a Wi-Fi network and it injects packets of data that causes clients to get disconnected. So it's a kind of denial of service attack. Now, it's almost certainly illegal, and it's not something I was particularly interested in doing anyway. However, one thing I was interested in was the description that says that this was an ESP8266 powered device, just like a Wemos D1 mini board, for example, which I've used in various escape room projects in the past. So in this video, what I'd like to try to demonstrate is how you can reprogram one of these watches for slightly less nefarious purposes. So let's take a look at the hardware that you actually get. Um, so it arrives in this quite fancy kind of watch presentation box and you also get in the package um, a single page of photocopied instructions and also this electrostatic bag and if I take a look inside that you'll see that that contains these two uh, Wi-Fi aerials with IPEX connectors at the top. Um, but I'm just going to put those to one side for a moment and that's actually take a look at the watch itself. So open up the box and like I say it's actually quite a fancy uh, presentation case. It even has sort of one of these little velvet pillows that it's sitting on. Well it's probably not velvet but you get the idea. Um, and then if we take a look at the, the face of the watch itself, I'm going to start off by just turning it on. Uh, so there's a little power switch at the top here. I'm just going to slide that on. And once I do that, you can see the nice OLED display at the top here. Um, and it, we've also got an RGB LED, like a NeoPixel, and possibly a buzzer there at the top. Um, and then down at the bottom, we've got a row of 2.54 millimeter pins. Um, then on the left-hand side here, you can see we've got a USB micro connector at the bottom and two micro push buttons. And then on the right hand side we've got another push button, that's the reset button. Uh, that's the switch which I push to turn it on and we've also got this kind of rotary dial which can be uh, pushed in and also cycled round. So um, it's actually pretty nice, it's got a 3D printed case as well holding it in. Now I'm going to turn it off and open it up so we can actually take a look at how those components are all wired inside. Um, so I have to say that the design's actually um, pretty neat for this device. Um, it's got these four screws on the, the front face um, and they're actually very accessible, they're easy to get to. And if I just get that one out, that's two down. Take this one out. I do like kind of devices that have been made uh, in, in mind of how easy they are to actually access the components inside them. There's nothing worse than kind of having to fiddle around with little access panels and things. But that's the four screws and now hopefully, I'll just turn that around, if I just lift the front face off and take a look inside. The first thing you can see, we've got a, a LiPo battery here. So we've got a 500 milliamp hour 3.7 volt battery. And if I just move that to one side, you can see we've got a ribbon cable that's connecting the uh, the front face and the components on the back and then right at the back there you can see very clearly we have got an ESP8266 chip. Uh, that's the big silver thing at the bottom there uh, if I can get that shining in the light. So um, what I now need to do is to work out how I can program that chip to do something else using all those components so the buttons and the, the pixel. Unfortunately, and rather surprisingly, if I refer back to that um, information sheet that came with it, you'll see at the bottom here, it actually gives me a whole lot of information about those components in more detail. So I've got the type of display, it's an SH1106, 1.3 inch, and I've got the pins that uh, each of the components are plugged into. So with that information, I can go about writing my own software. 
So I fired up the Arduino IDE and created a new sketch. And the first thing I did was to set the target board as a Wemos D1 Mini. Now that's not exactly the same as the board that's used inside the watch, but it is another ESP8266 based board. Um, and I'm hoping that it will be compatible enough to expose all of the functions we need. Um, now having done that, the first thing I've done at the top of my sketch is to include some third party libraries which are going to help me access the different components that we've got on the board. Um, now as it happens, these are all libraries that I've actually used in the past in previous projects, so I already had them installed. But if you don't, they can all be installed through the Arduino IDE by going sketch, include, libraries and then manage libraries. And I've included the name of the library I'm using and also the version number as well. Um, this was actually something that kind of came to bite me in a recent project I did um, because I upgraded a library which I'd got installed and the newer version included uh, breaking changes that caused one of my projects to break. Um, so I'm using 3.4 for example of Fast LED, which is currently the most recent version but if a newer version comes out uh, you can also you can always downgrade to a, a previous version by selecting what version you want here and installing that instead. Uh, so the version numbers I've listed here are the ones I'm using and I know those to work uh, just in case this comes up in the future. So I've got uh, fast LED, that's going to be for controlling the WS2812B RGB LED on the front. Um, I'm using the bounce to library, that's to help with getting the button inputs and make sure we get a nice clean uh, signal when the buttons are pressed. I'm using LCD GFX, that's for controlling the OLED screen on the front, the display. And this is like a, an optional extra library that comes with this one that makes it easy to create menus and graphical user interfaces uh, to display on the screen as well. So I'm going to use that to, to provide a little menu that we can navigate to, to test the functions on the screen. I'm also including ESP8266 Wi-Fi. So this is the built-in library that's going to help us use the Wi-Fi functionalities on the ESP8266 chip. So then we go to the constants. The constants are the things which are going to remain the same throughout the entire sketch. And this whole section here, I just copied this from that uh, photocopied sheet of information that says which pin uh, on the ESP8266 corresponds to which function. So we've got the I squared C interface to the display, that's four and five. We've got the two buttons up and down and also clicking it in, they're on 12, 13, 14. And then we've got a single data pin for the RGB and a single pin for the white LED, which is on the side as well. Uh, this bit here, so like I said, we're going to create a, a little menu that's going to let us test these different features. And I want three different menu options. So this is just a, a character array that uh, gives what we're going to display as the three menu options there. So we're going to test the white LED, test the RGB LED, and test the Wi-Fi. And you can just add more and more on the end here for however many different functions you want to, to have. Then we get to globals. So globals are variables which are going to be sort of shared and last throughout the, the duration of the sketch. So we'll define uh, an RGB value that's going to uh, describe the colour of the LED on the front of the board. Um, we'll actually declare an object that is going to represent our display. So the constructor here is a little bit complicated. Um, minus 1 basically means use the default value here. Um, 0x3c, that is the, uh, the I squared C address of the, um, the display that's being used here. And again, that came from the data sheet anyway. And then we supply the clock and the data pins that it's connected to here. And they were defined in our constants up the top. Um, then we actually create our menu to display on the um, on the OLED display. So we feed that to the menu items, which is the character array we defined up here. And we initialize some bounce objects on our three inputs that we're going to have. So that will help with debouncing the input. That's when you kind of accidentally register a double press if you press the same button quickly or something like that. That's why we're using the, the bounce input to prevent that problem. And we're going to set up. So this runs once when the code first starts up. We initialize the pin that's going to drive the 
uh, the white LED on the side. Now I found out from experimentation that this is a kind of an active low pin. So when we start up we want the LED to be off so to do that we actually write a high signal to the pin and when we want to turn the LED on we write a low signal which is kind of the opposite from you might expect um, but I guess it's going through some sort of transistor on the way that's reversing the, um, the logic there. We'll initialize the RGB LED as well so we use this function of the fast LED library for that. We pass it the type of the LED, the pin that it's connected to. Uh, this is green, red, blue byte ordering, um, which is commonly used by WS2812B um, chips. If you have a slightly different one that comes with a different style of chip and you know if you tell it to light up red and it actually comes out green, or if you tell it to light up blue and it comes out red, uh, it's probably because you've got the byte ordering incorrect there. So you can just try different byte ordering values. Uh, but the one on my watch at least, the bytes are listed in green, red, blue order. And we give it the, the actual array that we are holding the value in at the moment. We'll initialize it to black, so that's another way of saying turn it off. Um, so just as we turn the white LED off, we'll turn the RGB LED off as well. And we'll actually call the show method to send that value to the LED. Then we'll initialize the display. So uh, we will start the interface to the display. We'll set the font that we want to use. That's going to be used every time we call the command to draw some text to the screen. It will be using this font, which is a, a tiny font, but it is legible, um, so we can fit lots of information on the screen. We'll just fill the screen with black to start with, and we'll clear any values in the buffer. And then we will actually uh, attach our bounce objects to the pins they're going to listen to. So up here, we declared the uh, bounce objects that we're going to have. And then here, we're actually going to attach them onto these pins so that we can get a nice uh, debounced input when we press them. And then we go on to the main program loop. So uh, this loops over and over and over again while we've got the watch turned on. And in every iteration, what we do, well, the first thing we need to do, we need to check whether any buttons have been pressed. So to do that, we call the update function on each of our three bounce objects here, just to get the latest value to see whether they've been pressed or released or held or whatever. And then depending on the output of those, we can then do different things. So if the down nav button was pressed, we're going to move down one menu option. If the up nav button was pressed, we're going to move up one menu option. And then if the uh, nav button was clicked in, well, the thing we want to do then depends on what menu option we are highlighting at the time. So that's what this switch menu selection statement means, is to say, well, okay, the action that happens when this is pressed switches depending on what menu option was selected. And we've got different cases that correspond to the uh, different texts that we had up here. So remember we had test the LED, test the RGB LED, and test the Wi-Fi. And they correspond to case zero, case one, and case two. So case zero, this is testing the white LED on the side. So what we'll do is we'll write a low signal to that pin, wait a second, and then we'll write a high signal to that pin. So that will just cause the LED to flash for one second. Nice and simple. Uh, case one, so this is testing the RGB LED on the front. So what we'll do here, we will set up a loop that goes from 0 to 255. So that is all of the values of, uh, of the hue that can be represented by colour. So um, fast LED is, is quite clever. You can either send it a colour in an RGB format like this. So RGB 000 is black. RGB 25500 would be bright red. But you can also send it a hue, saturation, and um, uh, oh, I forgot what the V stands for. Um, I think it's just value, actually. It, it basically means brightness. Um, so what we're doing here is we're maintaining the same amount of color saturation and the same brightness, but we're cycling through the rainbow of uh, color values here. So we'll do that, uh, show each one, delay just by 10 milliseconds and cycle through the whole rainbow and then we'll turn the RGB LED off. And then case two, well this is testing the uh, Wi-Fi functionality. Now I wanted to have a, 
a simple case just to demonstrate the Wi-Fi to start with. Uh, so I didn't want to kind of retrieve a whole web page or anything. But what I thought I'd do is I'd just scan to show the available um, Wi-Fi networks that can be joined. So that's what we're doing here. So um, to do this, we need to display a bit more text on the screen. So we're going to clear away the menu that's being displayed at the moment. And instead, we're going to print a new message. It just says scanning for networks. We'll um, set the Wi-Fi mode into station mode. So um, ESP chips can operate both as an access point and as a station. And this terminology always confuses me. Um, but a station basically means a client that is going to join an existing Wi-Fi network. And an access point means that it is going to host a network. So it's like a hotspot basically is an action, uh, is an access point. But we want to operate as a, as a stationary because we're going to be a potential client to say, OK, what Wi-Fi networks are there out there that I can join? We'll disconnect first. Now, this tripped me up as well. So um, the ESP chip has some flash memory that stores cached values between runs. And one of the things it chooses to store is the credentials of the last Wi-Fi network you logged on to. And when I was testing this, and I was um, you know, changing different values and trying to get it to join networks, I could not work out why it kept on seeming to join a network that I had deleted all of the uh, credentials to join. And it's because it had cached it in its memory, um, which made debugging very hard. But if you call disconnect first, even though we haven't got any kind of active Wi-Fi connection at the moment, that will also cause it to forget um, any cached values. So that's why we've got that at the beginning uh, there. And then what we'll do, we'll, we'll call um, scan networks to scan for anything available to join. That will return a number, an int, which is the number of networks found. And what we'll then do is we'll call i to a to convert that integer into a char value instead, just so we can display it on the screen. And this is the bit that displays it on the screen. So we'll say, we'll print that value. So the number of networks found, which is now a character string, uh, we'll say that many networks have been found and then we will loop through them all. So from i to the number of networks found we will print uh, at this um, row down, sorry, so we'll leave our font, remember that our font we selected at the top up here was a 6 by 8 font. So I'm going to count down 8 pixels multiplied um, by each row and then I'm going to leave one at the top because I wrote a text string at the top which is this bit here. So that's going to insert each row on the next line down basically and I'm going to print the name of the Wi-Fi network found. We'll leave all that information on the screen for three seconds and then we'll clear it out. Um, and then finally that's our last case in the in the um, statement. But if you wanted to add on, let's say you wanted to add on more functions to your menu, what you'd do is you'd simply add the uh, the text that you wanted the menu option to display as up here and then you would add more case statements onto the end of the switch here so we could have case 3, case 4, case 5 and you have as many as you want and default is just the, the one at the bottom in case uh, nothing matches if you select an option that, that doesn't have a match here. And finally we will show the display. So I've plugged in a USB connector into the side of the watch there and you'll also notice on this side I've got one of those aerials which I've plugged into the IPEX connector at the bottom here. That's going to increase the reception range for the Wi-Fi. Now you just upload the code from the Arduino IDE, same as you would any other device. And once that's done, we can unplug the USB again and then turn on the watch. And you can see straight away we've got our menu with our three different options. And if I rotate the wheel on the side here, I can scroll between them and they become highlighted just to show uh, which one we're on. So starting at the top, we go test LED. When I push this button in, you'll see the LED at the bottom here lights up for a second and then goes off as expected. So that seems to be working OK. We can go on to test the RGB LED. Remember, that's this NeoPixel at the top here. And now clicking the button in, we can see that scrolls through all of the hues in the rainbow from red all the way around through to red again. And we're going to test the Wi-Fi. So that's going to search for any uh, active Wi-Fi access points and it's found one, an ESP32. 
uh, which I've got running in the background here. Now, I haven't been able to get all of the hardware to work, however. Um, I mentioned that on the front here was a component which I thought was a buzzer, um, but actually I'm not so sure, and I, I don't sure how that's wired in. Um, also on the side here, we've got these two buttons here, but they don't seem to be connected. Um, I'm not sure if that's simply because they ran out of QPIO pins on the chip. But other than that, uh, that's all of the functions working. So hopefully that demonstration allowed you to see some of the functionality of the components that there are on this watch. But one of the pieces of hardware you might have noticed was missing was actually any kind of real-time clock chip. And that kind of makes it a little bit useless as a watch. Now, obviously it's got the wireless capability, so if you're in reception range of a Wi-Fi network, you could connect to an internet time server and download the latest time. But that's only any good if you're within range of a wireless network. And it doesn't have any kind of battery backup either, so when you turn the watch off and on again, it's going to forget whatever time it knew about. But as a wireless, portable, wearable device, it's actually pretty cool. And I mentioned at the beginning of the video that I normally make um, escape room props. If you've been following this channel, you'll know that at the moment I'm in the middle of creating an escape room in a box. And I've got the components that form the controller for that uh, device here. So I kind of thought, well, one of the fun things I might be able to use this is as a remote way of triggering the game of receiving status updates for a, a games master to interact with the device remotely. So I've actually made a, a little modification to the code which I just demonstrated. I've got two new menu options at the bottom which allow me to uh, activate and deactivate the hardware here. So uh, this is the ESP32 chip that you actually saw it detect the wireless network of. And if I scroll to activate here and click uh, the button inwards, what you'll see is that the red light comes on. That triggers a, um, an HTTP GET request to a web server that's running on the ESP here. And that starts the device off. You can see the countdown's running. You can also see that I've put this one upside down. Um, and I've also got a deactivate button here. So if I want to pause the game at any point, I can select that one and the uh, LEDs go off, the game pauses. Um, so I kind of thought that was a, a quite fun way to do that. You could even have uh, individual players in an escape room game each having one of these devices and they'd be able to access um, you know, different pieces of information. So this could be a, a hint delivery system for one thing. You could send messages to a wearable device that players have and you could actually make that information differ between players as well. Rather than just having one big TV screen that displayed hints to the whole team, uh, you can actually have personalised information. So I think they're, they're pretty cool. They're not very expensive and they're really easy to um, program just the same way as you would any ESP device. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully thinking of other uses for them in other projects. Um, but if you've got any questions about them, please do write in the comments, let me know and I will do my best to answer them. And thanks for watching.